Well, hey, good morning. Welcome to Reality Santa Barbara. Merry Christmas to you, your family and friends. Thanks for joining us for this very special online church gathering today. In case we haven't met, my name is Stephen. I'm the new pastor of Teaching and Vision here at Reality Santa Barbara, part of the new lead team alongside Joseph Pfeiffer and Karen Amling. And it truly is an honor to be a part of the Reality Church family. Speaking of, today we get to hear from Tim Chaddock of Reality Ventura. I can hardly wait for you to hear today's message. It really is special. But before we jump in, I want to let you know just a couple things happening around here at Reality Santa Barbara. First of all, some of you have been asking, how can we participate in an end of year giving? Is there an opportunity? And there is. Uh, Last weekend, we unpacked our vision for 2020 outreach at Reality Santa Barbara. Much of that has to do with continuing to support our eight local and international missionaries. If you'd like information on that, you can simply go to realitysb.com slash outreach, and you can read about all of our uh, local and international missionaries there. It's also a place where you can give if you want to be a part of the 2022 outreach offering, go to realitysb.com slash outreach and follow the links there and just look for the drop down menu that says outreach and you can contribute there. And next Sunday, January 2nd, don't miss Peter and Tammy Russell will be gathering together in person there at 410 State Street. And I can't wait for you to hear these amazing stories from a father in the faith, 30 years, uh, reaching some of the most unreached people groups in the world. Uh, there in Tanzania and beyond. And so don't miss that. And also stay tuned for details for our 21-day prayer tour starting January 10th. We want to begin our year together in prayer. Well, before we get into the sermon today, as we prepare our hearts, I want to remind you of a very strong conviction that we as a lead team have about you. And that is this, you have a destiny. And that destiny is to be shaped into the image of of Jesus, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, says that is not just the goal, that is your destiny. So being a part of a local church, following Jesus is not just about having right beliefs and doing right things. It's about becoming the kind of person who is more like Jesus tomorrow than you were today. More like Jesus today than you were yesterday. And so that at the end of your life, you can look back And you can see that you were transformed more into the image of Jesus. So get your Bibles out, build your faith, and let's hear from Pastor Tim Chaddock. Well, good morning, Reality Santa Barbara. It's so good to uh, join you online. My name's Tim. If I haven't met you yet, uh, I trust that all of you had a wonderful Christmas and that you are excited for uh, this new year as it approaches. And it's actually in light of the new year, and in light of the season of transition that you are in, that I've chosen my text to share with you today, which comes from the book of Colossians chapter 4. So wherever you are, whoever you're with, uh, why don't you grab a Bible and open up to the New Testament book of Colossians chapter 4, a letter written by the Apostle Paul, and in particular, the closing section where he shares a finishing charge to the church in Colossae. I'd like to read verses 2 through 6 and verses 16 and 17. We'll read the text, I'll pray, and then just share three encouragements that I have um, for all of you in this particular season as you approach this, this new year. So let me read Colossians chapter 4, 2 through 6 and verse 16 and 17, and we'll pray together for our time this morning. The Apostle Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And verse 16 and 17. After this letter has been read to you, 
See that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. And tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. This is God's word. Let's pray together for our time this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And as we open up your word, may you open up our hearts to receive this morning. I pray for my brothers and sisters in Santa Barbara and beyond that they would be encouraged and equipped as they approach this new year in this particular and unique season for their church. I pray that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would bring a word of encouragement to every heart and that they would know that their place in this community, in this church, in this time, matters to you and matters to this mission in Santa Barbara. So Spirit of God, would you speak to every heart and would you speak through me? We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as many of you know, my family and I lived uh, in London for five years and planted there and on a daily basis, you know, I'd walk the streets of London and often would come across Trafalgar Square with a giant column uh, as a tribute to Lord Nelson because it was in the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805 that Lord Nelson led the British Navy in one of the most decisive naval battles in history against the combined forces of France and Spain. And when he did, he famously emphasized the individual role of his sailors and Marines by simply saying, England expects every man to do his duty. And that phrase has always struck me because this is no less true for us in the church. The Lord Jesus calls all of us to do our duty by fulfilling the ministry he has given to us. No matter what it is in serving the church and God's purposes. And it is that truth that I want to draw your attention to in order to frame this sermon, this very simple yet profound truth that the Apostle Paul lays out, of course, through the book of Colossians, but in particular in his closing statement at the end in verse 17. Because for Paul, the driving force behind everything that, that he did was this awareness that he received his marching orders from God and thus he sought to be faithful in carrying it out. And that's where I want to lead us this morning because at the end of this letter, there's a very short personal charge from the Apostle Paul, if you noticed, to a man named Archippus. And it's a statement that might seem very random to us upon a casual reading, but it is full of meaning because it is a charge that's full of application for us. And for you in particular, as you enter into this season, a charge that I hope will help you move forward in faith. By way of context, Paul, of course, is an apostle, a senior leader in the early church, and his letters make up a third of the New Testament. And in the closing section of this letter, he mentions a few Christians by name, as he often does in his letters. At times, it's simply a greeting. At other times, it's an acknowledgement of their work. But here, it's a charge. A charge to this man named Archippus. Or more accurately, it is a charge that the church in Colossae was actually to give to Archippus. So imagine for a moment that you're in attendance at a Reality Santa Barbara church gathering or maybe go back in time and put yourself in the shoes of this man, Archippus, back in Colossae. You're there gathered and, and all of a sudden it's, it comes time for the preacher to come read the letter or give the teaching and all of a sudden your name is mentioned directly. 
your ears would perk up. You would listen. Imagine your name being mentioned in particular today during this message. You would pay close attention, I'm sure. I think it's a verse that raises vital questions for us to ask about our personal ministries and the need to fulfill it, especially in a season of transition. Because seasons of transition can be an opportunity for temptation or for transformation. It all depends on how you respond. As Pastor Chris Lazo has led and served over the years in his role at Reality Santa Barbara, he has had to ask the Lord about fulfilling his ministry. And now as, as he and his family step out into this new season, he has to ask the same question, Lord, what is the ministry that you have for me now and how can I fulfill it? And as Pastor Stephen Posey now enters his role to serve you at Reality Santa Barbara. He does so knowing that he has a ministry to fulfill. I know this because of our conversations personally, but he's also shared it publicly. Now, this might seem very obvious when it comes to leaders in the church, people with a vocation, people who work for the church or whatever. We're very often aware of the ministry responsibilities of our leaders. But here's my question this morning. What about you? What about your ministry? Because if you're a, a part of Reality Santa Barbara, then you have a ministry to fulfill in this church. And while it might be very natural for us to focus on the ministry of other people, especially those who are more vocational, all of us must ask, as I have to ask myself, what role am I to fulfill? What is my ministry in my church? And for you in this season, what is your place in this transition? Paul's charge to Archippus serves as our lesson this morning. And I want to give you three charges from this simple text. Because what is true about Archippus' ministry is also true about your ministry. The three points are this. Your ministry is from the Lord. Your ministry is for the Lord. And your ministry is to be fulfilled in the Lord. First, Reality Santa Barbara, your ministry is from the Lord. When Paul uses the word ministry here in Colossians chapter 4 verse 17, it is not an office that he refers to. It's a particular and individual responsibility. And he says that our cheapest, notice it says in the text, he's received it from the Lord. And it reminds us that each one of us has a responsibility given to us by God himself. Paul makes it absolutely clear what, or more importantly, who guides his decision-making process. Paul receives his ministry direction from the Lord. Now, friends, I think this is important because our temptation is of course to forget this and live as though it is by our own will or our own desires that we live. By what we want and not what God wants. Oftentimes our decisions of whether or not to serve in the church or how we serve in the church, really when we're honest at times, comes down to our own likes or dislikes, our own comforts or discomforts, or our opinions or other people's opinions. But I want to remind us this morning that to be a Christian, as we know, is to trust in and follow Jesus and to live in his service on his mission. We receive our ministries from the Lord. They do not come from ourselves. And I think this is particularly true in seasons of transition. Now, all of us react to change, you know, differently. 
Some of you may hate change. Others may see it as something really exciting. Many of you are probably somewhere in the middle. As I said earlier, seasons of transition can be an opportunity for temptation or for transformation. Some of us are tempted to just kind of give up and say, oh, I don't like change, I'm out. I don't want to be a part of any kind of a you know, tra transition. For others, we're more invigorated by it. Like, yay, I like change, like I'm ready, sign me up. But the point for all of us is that we can't just maintain. We can't just coast. We have to, in seasons of transition, ask ourselves these questions. Who is this all about? And am I all in? Am I all in to serve the Lord Jesus in this place, in this season? So the application for us is clear. Am I willing, in my context, are you willing, in your context, to allow your commitment and your responsibility to be shaped by Christ? Or will it be shaped by convenience? Will it be shaped by conviction that you have a ministry from the Lord? Because church, this is what it all comes down to. When it comes to serving in your church, it's about receiving your ministry from the Lord. It's all about him. It's all about him. I have to be reminded of this over and over again in, in my life. I know as my wife and I and my family has processed, you know, our, our 10 years of serving in, in Los Angeles and then God calling us to kind of leave everything and go to London for five years and then we're in London for five years and God calls us back to v Ventura. Like at every turn, we've had to be reminded like, okay, first of all, this is not my ministry, it's God's ministry. And we need to be obedient, remembering that it's all about what we receive from the Lord. God, what are my marching orders? What is it that you want me to do? How is it that you want me to serve? And so friends, my brothers and sisters, for you in Santa Barbara, I'm, as a brother in Christ calling you to be faithful, to serve the call that God has on your life in this season. And for now, in this church, and wherever God will call you in the future, what is it that he's calling you to do? How is it that he's calling you to serve? That is the question. Your ministry is from the Lord. And it is as God gives you clarity on what he's called you to do, you must then seek to carry it out. Because if you've been called to something, you then must be faithful with it. And that leads to my second charge this morning. First, your ministry is from the Lord. But second that we learn from Colossians 4.17, your ministry is for the Lord. And the way in which Paul gives this charge to our cheapest is a charge to be faithful. Paul wanted our cheapest to be strengthened and encouraged. That's why he includes his name in this letter. But notice, he does not make his appeal to Archippus privately. He doesn't just send him a little note or a text. He sends it publicly. He includes it in his letter that's going to be read to the entire church. Why? Why did Archippus need to hear this encouragement and hear it publicly? Well, all the commentators speculate was Archippus tempted to give up on his ministry? Was Archippus going to, you know, go church hopping and see which congregation had, you know, the, the best music or, or programs or, or serve in the ministries where people liked him most? Some speculate maybe he was tempted because he wasn't getting enough praise from others. Or maybe he was a little more on the, the lazy side. Maybe he was disconnected. Some speculate that maybe he was discouraged or even exhausted. The point is, of course, we don't know the reason that he needed to hear this. But we can be sure that the Holy Spirit meant for him to hear it. 
We don't know why. We don't know what was going on in Archippus' life that compelled Paul to say, hey, when this letter's written, I want you to say this publicly, Archippus, fulfill your ministry in the Lord. The Holy Spirit meant for him to hear it. Of course, reading it publicly would highlight how important his ministry was. Hearing this charge publicly would highlight how he needed also encouragement from other people. Because notice the way that this is written, our cheapest needed to hear this encouragement from the other people who were around him. And friends, don't we need the same? I mean, Paul's telling the church in Colossae to then charge our cheapest to fulfill his ministry. He was in a community. And it was in that community, in the context of his church relationships, he was meant to take up his responsibility from Christ and fulfill it for Christ. One of the reasons why we try to put so much you know, time and effort and prayer into decision makings, especially as it pertains to the church, is because I know for me, I'm constantly reminded that our purpose is to be faithful to God in any and every ministry for however long he desires. And then when that particular season or that ministry is through, it's a matter of being faithful in the next ministry. And a lesson I've learned over the years is that unless God has made it clear to me that my current ministry in the church is fulfilled, I'm called to be faithful within it. And the same is true for you. Unless God has made it abundantly clear that your current ministry has been fulfilled, you are also to seek to be faithful within it. Reality Santa Barbara, you have a ministry from the Lord and it is to be fulfilled for the Lord. And that means that you individually have a ministry to fulfill within this church for however long God has you here, for such a time as this, in such a place as this which is an encouragement. Your presence matters. Your ministry matters. Your service matters. Some of you, God may call to move to other places, other cities, you know, in in the future. Some of you, God will call you to stay in Santa Barbara for a very, very long time. The point is, wherever God has called you to be, you're called to be faithful there. You might even be new. You might even be, you know, joining us online and you're like, hey, I'm kind of new to Santa Barbara. Does my role matter? Yes, it does. Absolutely. Your service matters because every person in the church matters to Christ and matters to the rest of the body. Every person is gifted by the Holy Spirit to to bless and to serve other people in in the body. And it's in seasons of of transition and times of change that that we come to realize that in a very powerful way, like my ministry matters. I want to fulfill it for the Lord. And we must not think otherwise. It's no... uh, surprised that Charles Spurgeon means very much to me, as he does to to many. But I'll never forget a particular book I read when I was early in ministry, almost 20 years ago. It was a collection of Spurgeon's sermons put in a book called All Around Ministry. And it was one particular chapter that struck me. It was a chapter on the individual responsibility of every saint in the church. And it bears quoting at length. This is so good. Spurgeon says, if I am a soldier set to guard the army at a certain point, I know that every post in the whole line of soldiers is important, but I am not to dream that mine is not so. If so, I may be inclined to sleep and the enemy may surprise the camp at the point which I ought to have guarded. I am to feel as if the whole safety of the entire camp depended on me. At least I ought to be as zealous and as watchful as if it were so. You see the links of a chain. Each one of them has a certain strain upon it. Suppose one of those links should say, I can rust through. It doesn't matter because the other links are strong. No, my friend. 
The chain depends on each link. And so for the completeness of church work and for the perfect edification of the body of Christ, a great weight of responsibility lies upon you. You have a ministry to be fulfilled. Times of of change, times of transition changes none of this. Now, I'll be honest, circumstances may make it easier or harder. I know that's the case in my life. But until you have fulfilled the ministry that Jesus has given to you as an individual or even as a church, you are to continue to be faithful in it. And when the Lord Jesus gives you a new ministry, calls you to a new season, or perhaps even to a new place, that is prayerfully discerned, then you take that step and seek to be faithful in that. Whatever gift you have, it is from God, and it's a big deal. He's placed you in this community. You have such an important purpose in the body of Christ. And so, I say this to you collectively. You, as a church, you have a ministry to fulfill. And along the way, like every church, some will be called in, others will be called out, just like it was in the New Testament. But the ministry of the church continues. And you and I, as individuals, are simply to ask Jesus, what is the ministry I've received and how can I be faithful in it? How can I fulfill it for the Lord? And it's worth saying, we also need to encourage other people to do the same. Just as our cheapest needed the whole church to encourage him to fulfill his ministry, we need to encourage the people around us to fulfill their ministry. We need the people around us to encourage us to fulfill our ministry. Can you imagine when this letter was written almost 2,000 years ago and they're just reading it, you know, from the Apostle Paul and everyone's there gathered in the church and say, hey, and tell our cheapest to fulfill his ministry. And everybody in the room looks around like, hey, our cheapest, good job, bro. Keep going, do it. How can we help you? I mean, imagine if we acted like that in our churches. That would be amazing. Because we need other people around us to encourage us to fulfill our ministry. Make it one of your goals, one of your aims, one of your resolutions, if you will, in this new year in in this church to, to actively go around to other people in the church and say, how's your ministry? I want to encourage your encourage you in your ministry. Hey, the other day, you prayed for people. You prayed for me, and God answered that prayer. Or the way you were serving the children, the way you were leading in worship, the way you were serving in hospitality, the way you were, you know, sharing the gospel and evangelism. That was so powerful. That was awesome. Friends, what a beautiful opportunity it is to encourage one another to fulfill our ministries. In fact, this should be one of the defining marks of the church in every season but in particular seasons of transition, a desire to be faithful and to help others do the same. I know as I've been talking to, you know, Pastor Chris and Pastor Stephen about their seasons of transitions, I can only help but to like reflect on my own seasons of transition where my family has moved and I'm serving in different churches. And it's very easy, I know, for me to, you know, just kind of allow fear or uncertainty to, you know, kind of influence the way that I think. But instead, I always have to be reminded of this simple truth. I've got a ministry from Jesus, and I need to be faithful in it. Or to use Paul's phrase here, I want to fulfill it. Like our cheapest, maybe, though we don't know for sure, Maybe some of you are tired. Maybe some of you are discouraged. Maybe some are even disconnected or just have grown for various reasons. Maybe a little indifferent. Maybe you're just in need of encouragement this morning. Well, whatever state of mind you are in, we can take this truth to heart. You have a ministry from the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is to be fulfilled for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in doing so, 
We're called to encourage one another. And we're called to do it constantly because your ministry matters. Friend, you are uniquely gifted by the Holy Spirit to serve in the church. You matter to Jesus. And your presence and your ministry matters to the church. And how do we carry that out? Where do we find the power to do so? Well, that's my last charge to you. Number one, your ministry is from the Lord. Number two, your ministry is for the Lord. But number three, your ministry is with the Lord. Or to use Paul's phrase, your ministry is in the Lord. Notice how Paul says it there again in Colossians 4, 17. He says, our cheapest, fulfill your ministry in the Lord. And this is of such great encouragement to my heart, and I hope it is to yours. You can be faithful in your ministry because the one who calls you to ministry is himself faithful. Paul says, fulfill the ministry you have received in the Lord. And by saying in the Lord, he's reminding us of the one we're doing this with. He's reminding us of our life source. He reminds us that in order to do anything for God, we must be in a relationship with God because every ministry flows from intimacy with our Lord and Savior. And it is from this place of relationship with God through Jesus Christ that we are empowered to be faithful. Christ is the sure foundation who enables you to flourish anywhere and endure anything. Friends, this is an invitation as you approach this new year to rest upon and to build upon your relationship with him. You will have a powerful presence in your church and in your community because you have a powerful presence in your life. That is the presence of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Church, your strength is not found in who in particular is, is serving or setting up or, or preaching or organizing on a Sunday. It is found in relationship with the living God who calls and empowers people to serve and to preach and to set up when you gather together. And so what should not change in our communities is the emphasis on faithfully preaching the word, preaching the gospel, committing to prayer, connecting in community, and reaching out to the people around you. Knowing that we not only receive this from the Lord and are to fulfill it for the Lord, but we do all of this in the Lord. And so friends, as you enter into this season of change, within a year of change, we are encouraged not to do so with fear, but with faith. We respond not with the knee-jerk reactions of our flesh, as I often do, but with the love-driven motivation of faith. When we read scripture, in particular the charges in, in the New Testament, as it pertains to our role in ministries, we remember that we are called to pray. We're called to be a praying people. We are called to stay connected to one another as the vision is laid out from the Lord through the local church. We are called to stay connected to one another, to love one another, to serve one another. We're called to press in to the presence of God and to press on with our ministry from God. And you're to do it together. So my encouragement to you is essentially the encouragement I would give myself and the men and women I get to serve a few miles down the freeway. As we approach this new year, commit this season to prayer. Double down on the commitment to scripture. Commit to the preaching of the gospel. Commit to loving and serving the people around you. 
There may come a time when you have fulfilled your ministry in a particular place, in a particular time, and to a particular people. But until God makes that clear, fulfill your ministry now by being all in for Christ. This is the posture I would hope that we would all have as we approach the unknown in 2022. Because you, like me, and we may have a lot of questions about what this next year holds. But there is no question when it comes to who leads the church and where our direction and our power comes from. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ who came to save you, who came to live for you, who came to die on a cross for your sins and for mine, who rose again on the third day, who ascended into heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ who lives forever to make intercession for us. If you're not yet a Christian and you're wondering like, man, how, where do I get my sense of direction? Where, like, what is my life all about? How can I deal with my guilt and my shame? The answer, friend, if that is you, is Jesus. If you've not yet trusted in Jesus, do so this morning. Just say from your heart, Jesus, save me. Not because of what I've done, but because of what you've done. I believe you died for me on a cross to forgive me of all my sins. You died in my place and you rose again. I believe you're the son of God, came to save. Trust in him today. And church, double down on that commitment to him. Because when we look to the cross, when we look to his resurrection and his present ministry, he's committed to you. He's more committed to you than you could possibly imagine. He's more committed to me than we could possibly imagine. And so our response for such a time as this is hearing the words of Paul which we should say to one another in light of Christ's commitment to us and to his church and to his people and to the lost, we can say to one another, see that you fulfill the ministry you received in the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you have called us, you've saved us to be with yourself and from that place of relationship, you send us out and call us to serve in the church and to share your good news with those who are lost. I pray for my brothers and sisters in Santa Barbara. I pray that they would have a renewed sense of their call, a renewed conviction of their ministry, however you've gifted them. And that by the power of, their, of, of the Holy Spirit, that they would seek to carry it out as unto you. Knowing that ultimately they're not serving for the praises of men. They're serving you. They're serving out of love. Love for you because you first loved them. So Father, I pray for us all that we would seek to be faithful with the ministry that you've given to us. Knowing that when we breathe our last one day, you will not say, well done, my good and successful servant. You will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Because that's what you've called us to be and that's what you've empowered us to be. Faithful in your ministry. So by your grace, would you help us, God? Especially in this season, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us for today's very special online church service. Before I pronounce a blessing over us, I wanted to introduce you to my family. This is my lovely wife, Ruth, my daughter, Grace, my sons, Jackson and Bronson. And we're so thrilled to be a part of the Reality family. And so we just want to say Merry Christmas to you guys. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Uh, now may the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a great week. We'll see you next weekend.